Hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 571. Today's episode is on teaching martial arts to non-neurotypical students. It's a long title, it's a big word, but we're going to get into it. Who am I? I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, and I love martial arts. I love training, and I love it all. We are not style-specific. That's really important to me. And if you want to see how we manifest that, all the things that we've got going on, you can go to whistlekick.com. Check out whistlekick.com. That's the place where you're going to find our store and all the other things that we're working on. Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio gets its own website. And if you've been following along the hacking saga, well, it's on a new host now as of a few days ago. And guess what? It works. Still got some stuff to clean up, but if you've been looking for episodes that haven't been loaded yet, they're starting to go up and we're fixing all kinds of screwy things. And while incredibly unlikely, if the people who hacked the website are out there listening, uh, can can we spar? <laughs> I got some frustrations that I want to take it out on the people who did it, not other people. Now, speaking of all that, how do we cover the costs of things like this? Well, one of the ways that we do it is through the stuff that we sell. We've got products. We've got Protective equipment, though not, admittedly not a lot of it right now. We have plenty of apparel. We've got training programs. We've got a bunch of stuff. And if you make a purchase at the store, you can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% off all the stuff that we've got at whistlekick.com. Now, what are you going to find at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com? You're going to find the episodes, the transcripts, videos, photos, links, all that good stuff. Why do we do what we do? Well, as traditional martial artists, we're looking to connect with other traditional martial artists, educate you, entertain you, wherever you are in the world, no matter what you train. And if you want to support us, yeah, you can buy something in the store. You could share this episode with somebody. There are a lot of different ways. If, if you think of what would be helpful to you if you were running an organization, if you do that for us, that will be helpful. Now, one of the other things you can do, you can support our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. There are a number of you out there who contribute to the Patreon, and it all helps. I really appreciate it. It goes a long way to offsetting the expenses of this show, which are rather substantial. And for those of you who do, well, we give you stuff back. We give you book drafts. We give you programs. We give you exclusive audio, video, behind the scenes. It's worth it. We have very, very few people who contribute to the Patreon and then stop. Why? Because we're doing our best to give plenty of value. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. That's where you go. I almost forgot that part. Now, back on episode 510, wasn't a whole terribly long ago, about six months, we had on a guest, Ms. Shirley Meyer. And one of the things that we talked about was her education of children, teaching martial arts to not just kids, but we talked a bit about kids. And we talked about some of the interesting and maybe non-typical demographics of people that she's worked with, people with certain needs. And we've been looking for someone to talk to about this specifically for a while. Leslie and I, Leslie doesn't get talked about much publicly on the show, but Leslie's behind the scenes. Anybody who's come on the show has dealt with Leslie. Leslie and I have been talking about how do we get somebody to talk about autism and teaching martial arts to students with autism. And after we talked to Ms. Meyer, we found, oh, here's someone who can talk to that subject, but broaden it. And that's why we have kind of a different subject than you might expect, a different title. Instead of restricting it to autism, Ms. Meyer and I talked a bit before we went live, and we ended up with this title, Non-Neurotypical. And we're going to explain what that means. She is, rather. And it's a really good conversation. Now, who should be listening to this episode? First off, instructors. Everybody who teaches should be listening to this episode. Next, what if you're not a teacher? Well, there's a good chance that you're going to interact with someone somewhere in the world with one of these non-neurotypical expressions. And I came away with a much better understanding, and I'm sure you will too. So let's do it. Welcome back. Hi. Hi. You must not have had a, a bad time when you were on before because you're here again. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of fun. I mean, Good. I goodness, you're, you're willing to listen to me babble. I love it. 
one of the bits of advice that I've gotten uh, just in general in so many different aspects of life is let other people talk. Right. And that's what this show is. I, I just let other people talk. And so often people tell me, oh, man, you are the best interviewer I've ever worked with. I, I don't really say that much. And that's what I find ironic. I just give people the space to say what they want to say. Well, most people don't realize that even in conversation, they're not listening to the other person. They're only listening to formulate a response. They're actually not paying attention. Listening to reply is how I've heard it put. Exactly. And so thank you. I appreciate you coming back. We've got some, I don't know if we want to call it a heavy topic because it's not necessarily heavy, but I think it's an important topic. And it's one that is, if we follow the numbers, is growing in importance every year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you and I, we, we were talking and, and I think we, we've got our, our title. So listeners, if the title that I talk about in the intro and that you clicked on is slightly different from this, please don't get mad at me. But right now, you know, we're ta talking about it as teaching martial arts to non neurotypical students. And since I have the, the, the pleasure of you being here, can you mm -hmm. tell us what you mean by non neurotypical? Years ago, people would have called them eccentric or odd or, you know, he's just a weirdo. Kids who have autism, kids who have OCD, kids who have um, ADHD or ADD, it's, it's a huge spectrum of not exactly neurotypical responses. That's why we use the term neuro, not neurotypical. It started basically because autism was too narrow, uh, you know, and then they added Asperger's. It was, you know, they, they tried to keep expanding in the DMV uh, what they were talking about. And uh, it's easiest to say just not neurotypical. Sure. And I, I would assume being a broad and, and seeming... Um almost subtle term because it's so collective and, and doesn't seem to put weight in any one direction. It's, it's not a term that's going to be offensive to anyone or, or right. unlikely to be. Right. Well, you see, I'm, I'm, I can refer to myself as a neurotypical, uh, even though I know on some levels I have, uh, I have some of the same self-soothing tics that my sons have, mm. you know, uh, normal people or neurotypical people have little rituals that help them feel better if they're in a stressful situation. Uh, in a non-neurotypical situation, those tics and gestures and ways of behaving become the dominant way of behaving. It's a... Uh, it's a matter of focus. They they can only focus. Kids kids who are on the spectrum tend to be able to only focus on feeling safe. What what makes them feel safe or better or allows them to at least be in a stressful situation. And you've got experience teaching martial arts, including martial arts to kids and as I'm sure anyone who can follow the breadcrumbs that we've laid out up until now, the mm -hmm. reason you're here, you have spent time teaching martial arts to people with or, or that are non-neurotypical. I was teaching uh, differently abled self-defense classes before my sons were born. Uh, and usually it was uh, physical differences. But I had a lot of kids who were down syndrome. I found that on some levels, it was easier to teach the girls with Down syndrome than to teach the neurotypical girls in grade six, seven, and eight. Oh, interesting. Because the popular girls and the ones who were really, you know, the golden kids in class tended to question what I was trying to tell them. And if I told the girls with Down syndrome and other, uh, you know, not neurotypical, you know, um, behaviors, if I told them they could do X, they said, oh, okay, and walked over and did X, like breaking a board. Um, 
very specifically, the there was one class I taught. The most popular girl in the school was in there. And she was a golden girl. She was a, you know, you know what I mean, right? I do. I do. She found it nearly impossible to break. I mean, at the time, my graduation exercise for the girls was to break a one inch board with a hammer blow, right? Something that she, the girl who, who was the most popular girl, found it nearly impossible to do. She talked herself out of it so many times. She sat there in front of the the two concrete blocks on the board and she cried because she 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 would put her fist to the surface of the board and say, see, I can't do it. See, I can't do it. I had to give her a rolled up magazine so that she wasn't afraid of hurting her hand. And she did it. But I'll have to say that every single girl in my class, the same same girls, the same class, who had Down syndrome, one had Down syndrome, one had um, uh, another syndrome of some kind, I'm not sure what, it wasn't my business, I just taught them, I didn't ask. Both of them, I said, look, you do it this way, and you you aim below the board, and you know, make sure your fist is nice and tight, and away they went. Blam! They blew those boards into pieces. They trusted me. Uh, it was, I was it's easier to get some of the students, ones that maybe a, in a typical setting, people might look and say, hmm, this student's going to be more difficult because of some differences. And you're saying that, in, at least in some cases, those students are easier. <laughs> Because their egos don't get in the way. There's a recurring theme on this show. Funny ego. that. Yeah. Um, the, the girl who was most popular had the most to lose. She lost a lot of face sitting there doing that. And the girls who had Down syndrome gained a lot of face in that, in that classroom dynamic. I don't know how it played out, but I know that the... Um, the, the girls with Down syndrome went from being low chicken to they had some pride. Mm. You see, so I wasn't just teaching them self-defense. I was teaching them self-confidence. Because most kids who come into a martial arts class who are not neurotypical have had a world of you can't do X. You can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. As a martial arts instructor, it's my job to say, sure, you can do this. You know, you, you have good, really good focus. Listen to what I say, and, and you'll be able to do exactly what, what you want to do. You get a lot of, if, if, you, if you catch the kids just right, you get a lot of laser focus there, because a lot of non-neurotypical kids um, once they, they fit, fix their attention on you, once they realize that you have something they really want, you'll never get a more focused class. Really. Mm. I mean, from, from personal experience, my boys both have autism. Um, uh, they are on the spectrum. Uh, my youngest son, Raphael, is um, he has he has what is referred to as mild autism, and my oldest boy has something called PDDNOS, which is pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, which is alphabet soup for he's on the spectrum, but we don't know where. Sure. Anyway, I. I, I won a, uh, a certain amount of, um, of money on a, on a TV science show, actually. And I spent that money taking us all hang gliding. And I told the boys before we went out there, uh, as we were going out to the school, I said, you have to listen to the instructor. If you don't listen to the instructor, you will not get to fly. 
my oldest boy, he was the first one of us who managed to make it off the ground. The rest of us, our egos got in the way. We, 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 we really had to try. We had, really had to learn to let go and let the hang glider take us into the air. My son Tristan, he, he said, it's easy. You listen and you let go. He was the first one in the air. So teaching kids who are not neurotypical is as easy as finding, is, is finding what they're willing to focus on. Fascinating. Yeah. The funniest thing about raising autistic kids, um, much less teaching them, because I did, I did have to, uh, to do some martial arts teaching, certainly, and I was instructing while the boys were toddlers, so sometimes I couldn't get a babysitter and I had to bring the boys into the class. So that made for some interesting lessons. But... Um, uh, <sighs> I was talking about about um, about teaching. I just lost my train of thought. That's okay. That's okay. I, I, have, a, I have a question. Let, let's let's sure. follow this one, and I've got a feeling we'll end up back there at some point. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about even before your children were born, teaching and working with folks that were differently abled. I believe was the term that you used. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm wondering, is this something that you've been interested or passionate doesn't necessarily seem like the right word, but I'm not, I'm not coming up with a better one. Is it something that no. has been important to you maybe? Well, you see my friend TJ, you know, Teal James. Yeah. He's been on the show. Yeah. I, uh, yes, I, I realize he's the one who introduced us actually. Yes. <laughs> um, but uh, TJ was telling us when, when, when uh, he was, he was the presenter when I got my black belt. Hmm. So he was actually up uh, visiting us from from New York, and uh, he uh, he would stay at our place. And he was telling us about a class that he was teaching, a self defense class, because in New York at the time, people were attacking differently abled people. It was they were they were they were not only mugging they were they were targeting people who were visibly differently abled. Um, as targets just to beat up. And so TJ was teaching a class and he was talking about his, his various students. And I thought it was absolutely fascinating um, how little, you, you don't need to be a perfect physical specimen to defend yourself or to do martial arts. You, do, you just, you know, people who had, um, one of my best students was a lady in a uh, an electric wheelchair who had partial control of of her left hand. She was still perfectly capable of defending herself once once I gave her permission to use the chair as a as a weapon of war. <laughs> she had an absolute blast finding out that she could if she let herself she could chase anybody, you know, six foot tall guy trying to get her out of her chair. She could chase him around the gym at will. I'm having some great visuals imagining oh. this. It, sounds, oh. it, it, it was it, funny. It, it sounds funny, but also empowering. Oh, yeah, it was. Um, I mean, it's it's something that started with the, the story of, of Trist, uh, sorry, TJ's students. And then um, I was teaching with my ex. Um, we were teaching um, for sale up in Muskoka. Sale is um, sexual assault intervention for living. And the lady I was telling you about in the electric wheelchair had been assaulted in her care home by an attendant. And she was so infuriated that she organized the self-defense classes for, for people in her care home. And she hired us. Wow. So things kind of went on from there. Um, it, was, it was finding 
people people found that I was willing to teach them as people, not as disabled people, if you know what I mean. And, and I'm going to guess because, you know, one of the things we want to make sure that we leave people with today are some concrete, if, if not steps, at least pointers mm-hmm. of what they can do to better reach and potentially incorporate teaching non-neurotypical students into their curriculum. And I'm going to guess that that's rule number one. Yeah. Don't see them as disabled because they're not. Different. Differently abled. Exactly. I, I would imagine, I mean, just to, to take the example of the the woman in, in the electric the wheelchair, wheelchair mm-hmm. I don't want that thing on my foot. <laughs> Those are heavy. They, they, they're going to hurt. And I'm not going heavy, anywhere. Big. The minute the minute she actually moved forward, there's something that kicks in in your hind brain that says, "Oh, heavy, fast moving <laughs> object, get out of the way!" And you and the attacker in every case backed up, immediately backed up, and she caught their balance. She immediately got them off guard and could then chase at will because of a very natural human response to being approached by something uh, large, heavy, and fast-moving. All right. Let, let's, let's talk about some other things. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, there are going to be times where a mixed class can work, depending on the needs of some of the students. Mm-hmm. And there are times when they aren't going to be able to be is is mainstreamed in a corporate term here? Well, no, 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 no. It's okay. it's it's actually quite easy. Um, some oh, of the okay. best classes I I taught, uh, I had differently abled girls, um, and elderly women. I had to be careful of them learning how to fall without breaking a hip because that's the thing that they were focused on. Uh, and and uh, they were also focused about the fact that um, I I could not teach a closed hand punch in that class. I normally don't anymore. I teach um, palm strike because so many people have arthritis and their hands have been injured and they're you know um, so they can't close their hands. So I had elderly ladies on that end, and I had the the young girls. Uh, again, Down syndrome. And what happened is, is we were teaching um, middle of the class. You know, we were, we were, this was a 10 week class. So we were four, four or five in. So all the students were, they all knew each other and they'd all introduced, they all knew, you know, we were, we were getting cohesive at that point. And what happened is, is the, the one girl who had Down syndrome um, said, she didn't she, she brought out the fact that if somebody touched her and she didn't want them to she didn't know how to say no because she didn't want to embarrass them and she didn't know you know she, she if somebody is a friend she has to let them do what they want to her right i had a phalanx of elderly ladies surround this girl sit her down take her in there you know they literally they sat her down in a hug and and they all told her from various their various perspectives no this is how you do it politely it was it was the most astonishing thing and as a teacher i had to let that happen of course you know they yeah. took over they the the elderly ladies took over and presented lifetimes of dealing with people who you think have the right to hurt you and I, I want I want to jump in. I think I'm hearing some emotion in your voice as you're thinking about this. You're remembering it. Oh yeah, and, it, it got pretty emotional in class. And I, I think what I'm what I'm taking away from this example the most is, as martial artists, as traditional martial artists, we rely on structure and these these organizational systems within our classes for how they're run so mm-hmm. often. And here's an example of where letting it happen, letting a bit of that fall away temporarily Mm -hmm. was so powerful and so important. Well, 
I learned, I, I find that as a teacher, it is the best place that I learn. And, and if I'm trying to force rigidity, like trying to force uh, my safe space, let's do these exercises, let's do this, the class does this, I say this, the class does that, it kills flexibility. And um, my students have as much or more to teach me in a lot of situations. But like conversing with somebody, you got to listen to your students as well as shout at them, <laughs> you know? Um, you, you, it's, it's a weird combination of form. You get, you get a lot of non-neurotypical kids and the repetitive nature of the class you do this, you do this, you do this, and then you stop and you think about what you did. And then you do this and you do this and you do this. The teacher says this, you do that. It's a very safe, structured place for them to be able to open up to you eventually. It's a place where they don't have to flap or rock or talk or pull the skin off their, off their thumbnails um, while, while trying to learn a martial art because they're so stressed. You see, you start with a formal structure. But as a teacher, you have to know the teaching moment, the moment where you have to let go of the class and let them teach each other. Because they have a lot to teach each other, too. I mean... Why, why waste that opportunity? Right? Right. We're, tr we're troop. We're a troop species. We're not individuals. We're, we, we work best in community. And, uh, you know, the standard kind of community, I say Shaolin, and you know exactly what I mean. Yeah. You know? Um, all of the archetypes in the movies, it's always the community of monks. And then we talk about, we, we have the movie trope of the, um, of the heroic individual. But they always learned in a community somehow. And they're always defending their community. You see? And when I think about the martial arts schools that I've attended or, or worked with, excuse me, who are the most successful, they, they don't just allow that community. They nurture it. They fight for it. They recognize its importance. And, mm -hmm. and I suspect regardless of who you are and how you are abled, mm -hmm. it's, it's important. It's something of, of value. And the more you can foster it, no matter the, dem uh, the demographic of the students, the better yeah. off everyone is. Oh, yeah. Some of my best classes when I was learning uh, were when Sensei brought his kids in. And, you know, you'd be you'd be doing horse stance and Choji would be uh, riding his big wheel in between your legs. You know, uh, uh, practice your front kicks. Do not kick children in the head. You know, that kind of thing. Um, it's uh, it, it provides an extra level somehow of awareness. Because all of a sudden, there's vulnerable, there's little kids running around. And what was hysterically funny is when the toddlers decided, uh, oh, yes, we're going to, we're going to join daddy. And they, and they would line up with their father, and they would do the, the, the moves he was demonstrating. That's how they learned. Right. And, we, and we laughed our asses off, of course. <laughs> you know. But, you see, here's the thing with non-neurotypical kids they get enough serious in their lives really kids who are not neurotypical are more vulnerable than neurotypical kids a lot of people think they can be easily targeted and you, you know people treat them differently they treat them with more seriousness or either that or ignore them 
you know, they don't, they don't treat them like kids. And some of the best classes I've had when I'm teaching uh, kids on the spectrum is coming up with games that teach the move I'm trying to do. I'm trying to teach them and letting them have fun doing it. You know. Can you give an uh, example? Um, playing duck, duck, goose. For instance, uh, coming into a uh, Montessori school, Montessori schools are very, very, I mean, a lot of these kids have never really been taught any kind of competition. Cooperation, yes. Competition, no. So you throw, um, you throw a game like Duck, Duck, Goose in. And they find out that if they are going to be playing this chasing game, they cannot win if they chase the person who tapped them. They have to run the other direction. Just a little change of thought that let these kids who didn't understand competition with their peers, uh, let them have a fun game. And, and chase each other around the dojo. Um, the fellow who hired me uh, to teach these classes did not understand this. He said, oh, just teach them sit-ups, teach them push-ups. Where do you think you are in a violent, dangerous place? It's like, uh, I'm alive, aren't I? I wanted to say, but uh, anyway, he and I eventually parted ways, but... Um, but, uh, you know, they, they actually did not, the parents did not like me teaching their kids competition, which is odd. Mm. But it's games. Uh, here's, here's a really simple game. When I have um, a bunch of uh, grade fours, grade three, grade fours, and the boys are making fart jokes and, and making rude noises and... I basically want to show them Senkutsu, for instance, how to stand and not be moved. So I take off my black belt and I hand, you know, I have like 10 little kids on one end of my black belt. And I get into Senkutsu and I say, okay, your guy's job is to pull me across the room. A, a, a moment, please. For people who may not train in Japanese arts. Japanese arts. Senkutsu is a front, a front stance. It's um, it's a slight lean forward. It's if you ever see people uh, practicing football pushing, they automatically get into something called senkutsu, which is the one for, the one leg is forward and leans forward slightly, and the other leg is back. If someone pushes against you, it all goes through the hips, and they're pushing against the ground through your heel. If they pull, they are literally trying to pull pull you through your knee and it won't it won't work hmm. in one direction it is a very very powerful stance you know it's like trying to it's trying to it, it's the way your body shifts if you're trying to push a wall over you can actually try it if you like it's kind of fun but anyway i would get into this stance and i would hand my belt to 10 little kids and say okay pull me across the room and they wouldn't be able you'd have you know they'd be w wandering around like like all of them straining like heck <laughs> on my uh on my belt and uh and then i would say after they've you know they've, they've started to get a little tired i say okay i'm gonna go that way i turn around in the same stance put the belt over my shoulder and i say i'm gonna take one step now stop me and I would take a step, and and that way I would I would l literally show them how powerful that particular stance was, and I'd walk the walk ten little kids, dragging them across the room on my black belt. They loved it. They absolutely loved it, cause they got a chance to try and take the teacher down. <laughs> yeah. You know, ooh. What I'm hearing, and and. <sighs> It doesn't sound mm -hmm. like it's that different from teaching everyone else. So I'm, I, I, I think I'm going to bring it back. I, I think you said this. Was it the first rule or the second rule? You teach them 
my people first. Yeah. Is so then the question becomes because I, I've I've experienced, I've observed martial arts schools where they have struggled to teach non-neurotypical students. Mm-hmm. Is it because they're breaking that rule or is there is there more nuance to it? Oh, I want to make sure that the people listening are, are able to come away with uh, with some action items. You've got to hear. It's not just listening. You've got to hear. Because, you see, um, my... Um, my oldest, when he was in, he was in a phase where everything was echolele. He would not speak to you. He would, he would repeat uh, movie, movie tags, movie lines. Um, I got to realize that whenever he was particularly stressed, I would get, my name is Inigo Montoyo. You killed my father. Prepare to die. He was about six. Was it was it funny at the time? I'm, I'm possibly oh, it, embarrassed at laughing. No, no, no. It was hysterical. Okay, okay, um, good. It, it was so funny because then, I, but but you see, I had to hear it a number of times before I realized how he was applying it. It was like, do you remember the Star Trek uh, episode Darmok? Um, no. There was a there was a whole alien species. They spoke in phrases and aphorisms. They didn't speak in individual words. They conveyed meaning through mythic story. And trying to get the, the, the universal translator couldn't deal with it. Um, here's the thing. Uh, the main, in, in, the, in the episode, the main opponent says, Darmok at Jalabra, and who knows what that is? Their they their cultural mythos, we knew nothing about. So, in effect, my son was saying, "My name is Enego Montoyo. You killed my father. Prepare to die." When he couldn't face something, when he was so scared of doing something, my kid is not is not very scared of anything. But um, if he's approaching, if if he was approaching, say, a strange dog. My name is Inigo Montoyo. I kill, you killed my father. Prepare to die. But then he'd put his fist out, and the dog would sniff, and he'd tell me some other movie line. He literally was he literally was not speaking English. And until I realized that, I I had to um, I, I got so angry and impatient and. Because you know, I'd have to, I'd have to listen to movie lines over and over and over and over again, and and I got mad because he wasn't speaking to me, but he was. Here's something that I found the most difficult: dealing with autistic kids. I had to absolutely not take it personally. As a, a, I was raised in a German household. And you did everything right. You listened. You did, you know, and and everything you did was a reflection on your on your parents. So when Tris is bouncing off the walls and climbing into the attic and 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 hiding in the piano, I felt like a complete and total failure and miserable. And I got mad and I caught myself by the neck and said, "Why am I mad? What am I scared of?" I was scared of what people were going to think. I literally had to pull apart my own expectations for my children as reflected on me. I was not going to live through my kids. I had to, it, it took actually quite a bit of work and quite a bit of soul searching to be able to listen to my kid walk up to a strange person and say, my name is Inigo Montoya, you killed my father, prepare to die, and know that he was saying it because he was nervous. And they would laugh, and I would, and I would not have to feel bad about myself. As a teacher, if I start taking kids' 
who are not neurotypicals' actions personally, then I'm doing them a disservice. I'm not teaching at that point. I'm trying to impose. Hmm. Our society is really, really good at imposing things on us. And that's one thing that uh, is, is cracking things at the seams right now because we have so many non-neurotypical people that we can't do that anymore. It's not viable anymore to, to force someone into normalcy. Like my son, uh, my grandfather would probably have taken a belt to him to force him to be more normal. It was something that was done then. You didn't step out of line. You didn't, you, you, you didn't march up to total strangers and start talking to them as if you'd known them all your lives. Uh, my mother would have been embarrassed by that, except the weird thing was she was embarrassed because I did that. Now, I don't see myself as non-neurotypical, but um, all kids have all of these behaviors. The non-neurotypical ones just sometimes can't put them down. If that makes any sense at all. It does. So here's the thing. When you're teaching, go in, leave your ego at the door, and go have fun. Because the more fun you can have, the more everything sinks in. The more, the more gets absorbed. At least that's from my experience. And, and I would suspect that that's true. So far, just about everything you've said lines up with, uh, I, got, I got to be honest, the, the best instructors I've seen are doing all of these things. Mm. So I wonder, maybe, maybe we flip the subject in a way. What is different? What might be different? I, I actually, I took a note. You mentioned early on, there was someone in, in a class and you weren't quite sure what their non-neurotypical uh, expression, if, if that word's appropriate, yeah. was. You didn't ask. Is it okay to ask? Is it okay to ask a parent? If, if so, how do you ask? Well, you say, you, 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 you say, what things should I be careful of? Because every, like, any instructor who is going into a class, um, you, you cannot assume that everyone is going to be able to do everything that you ask them to. Uh, I mean, like my elderly ladies who couldn't close their hands, uh, the 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 woman who could not walk the uh the uh um the girl who who didn't know how to say no to her friends um you you have to find those things out or you can't teach i mean some of some of them are more obvious i mean aren't we all non neurotypical in some way sure you know and if i am a half decent teacher i'm going to try and find out where my students have these these work we have to do workarounds big deal you know i can't talk to one student about a certain emotional thing because they haven't worked through theirs yet i mean this this comes out of uh working with women uh who had been sexually assaulted you know uh working with women in um in uh, uh, shelters, um, working with working with uh, kids in the schools, because in a lot of a lot of uh, back rural schools, a lot of rural schools are still behind in ways of teaching things. Some schools are unconsciously a war zone for for some kids, you know, and and. Um, for someone to be not neurotypical, I don't want to make their lives harder. I want to teach them. That's different. And in fact, in teaching them, I can make their lives easier if I'm careful. But that's every student. That's all of them. Sure. 
Now you, you stand there and you walk in, you have a new class and you've got all these faces and you don't know any of them. If you assume that they can do what you can do, then you're not set to teach them. They're going to run screaming. In fact, I had a teacher tell me that that is a teacher, a good teacher's job to make you angry and drive you away. A neurotypical person being confronted by a teacher who is pushing them really hard to face stuff that they need to fix or that they, they will not, they will never progress in their, in their martial arts training. Um, that's, you, you can be, you can be a right SOB, <laughs> but if you have autistic kids, you can't do that. What you're doing there is you're being the, perhaps the one place on earth that isn't trying to force them into a, a space that they don't fit. And I would imagine that that leads to a lot of uh, joy for them and desire to succeed and, and please the instructor. You have, oh God, those are some of the, those are some of the most fun classes. I swear to goodness. Um, watching, watching a, a little boy who, who has a, an artificial leg, he's six. Um, and my instructor at the time, I was a green belt at the time, my instructor who currently is working as a nurse up north. Um, he's six foot three. He tries to get you to laugh by self, self-deprecating things. However, the little kid did the shoulder throw perfectly. He did the move perfectly. And my honking great instructor flew across the room. He honestly threw himself across the room because the kid did the move right. The joy on that boy's face, because he managed to throw the black belt. Trick is, you're reinforcing the correct movement. You're reinforcing doing it right. You're not trying to scream at him and say, do it right, don't do it wrong. You know, how many people in, in life really get anywhere when somebody says, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong. People who are not neurotypical trust you when you tell them things. So you got to tell them the good stuff. Or you're going to have some really unhappy students. That, that sound punctuated my next question beautifully. What, what about unhappy students? What about discipline? How, does, does discipline have to be handled any differently with this group? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I find I find the most undisciplined kids are the neurotypicals. They're the ones acting out and trying to show off, trying to get your attention, trying to trying to, you know, stand out. I'm starting to think that that is their atypicality. You know, you 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 treat kids like that differently. And it's, uh, um, I, for instance, uh, this summer, this last summer, I was teaching uh, uh, at uh, my equestrian instructor's summer camp. I was teaching martial arts on the lawn, and uh, one of the worst boys, he could care less. He was sloppy. He, he was never focused. I basically had, uh, I, I, I'm not quite sure why I did this, but I, I, I pulled him aside after the archery class and I said, look, uh, Charlie, I could use a hand. Um, and I figure you'd be able to help me move the archery butts inside. Um, but you have to run and go get on the horse right now. So, um, but I thought I'd ask you, he says, oh yeah, sure went off completely forgot i moved the archery butts in myself however i acted as if 
he had just not been able to help me. So I went and I said, you know, you don't have to worry. I got them in. But, you know, thanks for, for being willing to help me. The look on his face was, oops. <laughs> oh, oops. <laughs> Next day and, the, and, the, and the, the end of the week, I had a really attentive kid. Because I had treated him as if he had made a mistake instead of blown me off. You assumed the best. Yeah. Yeah. Because if I assume the worst, I'll get it. You know, um, a lot of neurotypical kids, a lot of boys, everybody assumes the worst of them. And so they act to that point. I flipped that on his head for, for, for this one, for, for this one kid. And I don't think anyone ever had done that before. Nobody had ever expected the best of him. So that's what we do. It's what you do. You know, it's, I, I wouldn't even say, you know, he could have been on the spectrum. I didn't know. He was in, he was in equitation classes. But I'll tell you something, uh, some of the horses straightened him out right quick. I believe that. Yeah. Anybody who knows anything about horses is probably chuckling right now. Oh, yeah, probably. Um, you know, they don't, they, don't, they don't have to bite. I mean, the funniest thing that happened, same kid. He was on this part Percheron. This was the end of 10 weeks of summer camp. The horses were exhausted. And this kid is trying to get the horse to do something he he's he's done perfectly a dozen times before. It was too much. The horse sat down in the middle of the ring like a dog. With the kid on his back. Of course, that was the end of the class. I mean, the, the horse decided the end of the, the end of that class. That was funny. But um, but, you know, the kid learned you can't force it. Especially not if it's an eighteen hundred pound horse. <laughs> so the thing is, there it's it's any instructor gets to take advantage of that of those situations too, right? That's one reason I like working with animals and kids, because because you get a lot more honesty and a lot less. Well, once you get past the ones that are afraid. You see, fear is something else again. Uh, discipline often, lack of discipline often rises out of fear. The kid is terrified that you're not going to like them. So they act, they act up, they act out, they, they're, they're, you know, they're louder than everybody else because they want you to see them. They feel invisible. They feel unliked. They don't realize that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And in fact, one of my jobs as a teacher is to kind of gently point this out to kids who are doing this. I could, I could scream and yell and jump up and down, and all it would do is make me look stupid. So uh, discipline is not imposed. Discipline is requested. And non-neurotypicals are much more likely to give you their focus and their discipline easily because their egos aren't in the way. In, in a, and, and once my ego got out of the way, I found them much, much easier to teach, actually. Because they're not playing silly games with you or trying to. Let's start to wind down, but let's, is there anything that we've missed? Any, any do's, any don'ts? You know, we, we've got quite a few on both sides of that line. Well, yeah. Um, if you're not having fun teaching typical neurotypicals or non-neurotypicals, if you're not having fun, if, if this is not making you happy, I'd say don't teach because you're going to pass agree. on your unhappiness. 
the most the most powerful thing you can do is go have fun. Okay. Just discipline and everything else, and and uh, and and doing it right falls quite naturally into line if you're having fun doing it. Makes sense to me. <laughs> Here's the thing. <laughs> The, the angrier you are, the more constipated you look, the more rigid your, your, uh, your uh, the more rigid your your motions, um, like a, like a, a karate student trying to do tai chi. And the more, at least, somebody in around you is going to laugh to try and balance that out and make you even angrier. And and make you angrier unless unless you can stop and see their point, and then and then you you can break through that rigidity. I mean, uh, you know, people don't do well becoming brick walls, really. So I hope I hope I uh, I, I gave you some interesting stuff. You did. You did. Now, of course, you were here a few months ago back on episode 510. Mm -hmm. uh, but contact info, websites, emails, social media, any of that stuff you can share with the listeners who maybe don't want to go look back at the past episode. It is, it is pretty much all the same. Uh, Shirley M. Meyer at gmail.com is my Gmail. I'm on Facebook as Shirley Meyer. Um, I, I actually have a Wikipedia page. Uh, and uh, I had a, a, a book coming out uh, then, a young adult uh, book called Lamia's Daughter. I have another book coming out on the 7th of January called Blood Marble. Uh, and it's kind of funny because uh, uh, it's a buildings roman. It's a, it's a fantasy that starts with the protagonist at age 11. Hmm. And he has been entirely untaught his whole life. His dad rules the world and nobody dares tell him no. Oh, interesting. This is going to come out after that. So, you know, you said January 7th. Where would people be able to find it? On uh, it'll be Amazon, unfortunately, but Amazon. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm going to be releasing that. Uh, it, it's the beginning of a series. Oh, cool! The Eclipse Court series. So, um, I'm I'm uh, I'm working on a new a new book that has I have no idea when it's going to be out, but uh, uh, I'm not at the moment doing any articles for amazing magazine, but, um, the amazing hard copy magazine for the last couple of years, I have articles on, on writing and how to write. Um, and, uh, don't go look at my website. It's not ready yet. I really want to thank Ms. Meyer for coming back on the show. Had a great time again. And this time, not only do we learn about her and kind of, say between the lines on some other things we, we learned a lot at least i did i hope you did if you are an instructor and you are not addressing this population i think you're leaving a lot of benefit on the table and it's something i'd like to see more martial arts schools embracing because well if you know anything about me you know my passion through whistle kick is making sure that martial artists throughout the world are sharing martial arts with as many people as possible and we talked today about some of the ways that martial arts specifically can be a boon for certain people. So thanks again, Ms. Meyer, and I'm sure we'll talk again soon. You can visit WhistleKickMartialArtsRadio.com to see the show notes. You're going to find photos and videos and links and social media and all kinds of good stuff over there for all of our episodes. And if you want to support us, well, you know what to do. There's tons of ways. Patreon, sharing episodes, all that good stuff is appreciated. If you see somebody out there wearing something with Whistlekick on it, say hello. If you've got suggestions, feedback, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.